All right, we are live. Dan Daly, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm good, Brett. Thanks to see. You. Thanks for ha- thanks for having me. Good to see you. Yeah, absolutely, man. Listen, um, th- this is super cool. I've, I've I'm really interested in this space. Uh, just recently, you know, I've been doing a lot of swimming specific podcasts, as you know. This is kind of a swimming channel in in a in effect, and um, I'm trying to branch out into other areas of the swimming world and kind of highlight different people in the space and you're just doing a brilliant job mate um very noticeable um huge following and uh kind of just want to bring you on today and kind of explore your story a little bit and then also you know dig into some of the 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 real nuts and bolts of what you teach and how you're teaching it and your philosophies and um it's a lot of it is uh, focused around endurance sports um swimming specific now uh, strength and conditioning. So, um, really exciting space. So just Dan, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Uh, well, first off, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm flattered. I'm a big fan of the podcast for sure. Um, some really big names on here. I'd love to listen to it. So I'm flattered to be on here. I'm excited to talk about it. Uh, I'm Dan Daly. I'm a New York city based strength and conditioning coach. Uh, I was a collegiate all American swimmer sprinter, um, got into the strength and conditioning world, segued into personal training and um, just slowly started to build a niche in the endurance world, working with marathoners, triathletes. Um, and over the last two years, you know, post or pandemic, really leaned into the swimming space, leaned into my marketing. Um, and just saw a need for co- helping swimmers connect the dots between strength and conditioning and being smart about their technique, being start, smart about their efficiency and, and just helping them uh, with their volume and their training, reducing injury. So uh, really going after that and just have this rekindled passion for swimming. I'm mean, getting into the open water space myself. I, w- I was a 50 sprinter, but getting into 10Ks and miles and helping people swim channels and things like that. So it's been an exciting uh, way to kind of get back into swimming and explore some different areas and help people be smart about swimming and strength. Oh, whoa, whoa. Hang on. You just said something I didn't, I didn't fully realize. You were a sprinter? Well, whether it's probably relative talking to some other people on this and talking to you, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I did. I. I did the 50 and ironically, it was uh, arguably my most successful event in college, but I would have considered myself a breaststroker and butterfly. Okay. All right. I mean, fair enough. But I mean, what happened, Dan? What did you get into the endurance side for? What, how, how did you get onto the dark side? <laughs> you know, I just needed uh, I just needed something different and the open water yeah. is so freeing and, and yeah. fun. And I was having all these endurance athletes come to me. So these half Ironman, Ironman athletes who were swimming longer and then right. channel swimmers and people wanting to do 10Ks and needed healthy shoulders and smart strength plans to re, you know offset some of the volume they were doing right no listen man you're doing brilliant um just quickly so people can find you uh, i want to get this out a couple of times during this podcast where's 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 your places that people can contact you and look at your stuff yeah uh, so i'm i'm most active on instagram at dan daly my last name is d-a-l-y uh, i have a website train daily.com and you can find me on other channels as well youtube twitter facebook things like that yeah, your Instagram stuff is so good, man. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything better on the internet in terms of the stuff that you're putting out for for swimming specific, um, you know, strength conditioning, um, swimming exercises. I mean, it's just high quality stuff, mate. Huge fan. So um, let's uh, let's dig into some of these things then, because I really want to spend some time here, kind of talking about the specifics. Um, but I will say this, actually, uh, I was having this conversation yesterday uh, and somebody, you know, was kind of going over my career and they're asking me, you know, what, what was kind of um, the most successful period of my life? And, um, and you reminded me of something when you, when you talked about the pandemic a little bit. And I truly believe that during the pandemic, there was a shift in um, who I am as a person and, and what I do and how I can really uh, influence the swimming community, but, but I've never been more challenged in my life during that period. I think, you know, I, all of us got to a point where, you know, our whole lives were completely just shut down in a way. And I re- specifically remember sitting right in front of this computer that I'm sitting in front of right now and thinking to myself, what can I do? This can't be the end. This, this, I, I can't stop. Like I remember just being so, um, kind of pushed up against a wall and, and challenged and thinking to myself, like, I've got so much to give here. I can't just not communicate. I can't, I've got to figure out this whole thing. And, 
And from the pandemic on, I feel like I've been in the best period of my life in terms of the, the quality of work that I've been putting out, the interaction that I've been having with people, the, the connection to the community. And it's, it seems like that something similar happened to you during that period. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I went from an entirely in-person coaching model. I was doing group swim, one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions in New York City, and really isolated to like my New York City neighborhood in the Columbus Circle area, Manhattan. Mm. And then like suddenly New York City shut down and I left New York City and I, I wasn't working at all. And it's like, what do I do? I, I still want to be engaging with, I still want to be coaching. I still want to be engaging. And yeah. I had all this time on my hands and I started leaning into my marketing. I was strength training at home. I was posting content, just trying to share and like support others. And it grew in this organic way. And people are more open than ever to this, um, these digital outlets and these platforms. And it's never been a better time to be a content creator and be able to share this. And, you know, I've seen your podcast take off. Uh, my social marketing has taken off and my audience has grown like worldwide because of it. And mm -hmm. um, it's engaging, it's invigorating. And um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I'm interacting with people in a way that I never have. And um, mm. it's never been better. Well, I love it, man. And it says a lot about you, honestly, it really does. And, um, you know, great, great life lessons for a lot of people. And maybe, maybe in a few years from now, people will be studying you and how you actually went about it. So I, I love it. Maybe you can write a book. Is there a book in the horizon? Uh, somebody wants me to write a book if they're listening okay. to this. So uh, I could use some ideas to maybe narrow down uh, what people want to hear me talk about. Well, here we go. We're going to get into it. So um, I wrote a list um, and I, I have uh, I have gone over this list with you just briefly a minute ago. So I'm going to I'm going to start down the list here. Let's go straight into it. Let's go into the best exercises for swimmers, because this is such a huge topic and it might be too broad right now to dig into. But some of the best exercises for swimmers. Uh, and does that mean conditioning exercises? Does that mean strength exercises? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, we could talk about this in a variety of ways. I mean, the mm -hmm. best the best exercise for swimming is swimming. So if you're not doing a lot of that already, you probably should. And mm -hmm. when you get to a point where maybe you can't do more of that or you've exhausted like whatever the model is for the best approach for your goals, and like my lens is looking at it from a strength and conditioning standpoint. So my marketing is very swim specific, but like like real swim specificity is at like the top of the pyramid. When you look at like what most people need, even the highest level athletes, it's like, let's take a look at their function. How's everything moving? Um, are all the parts and all the hardware doing what they're supposed to be doing before we start talking about just the basic lifts, people doing squats and deadlifts, pushes and pulls. Um, as we start to like funnel through that and get a little bit more specific, I just I actually just answered this question on any question, but what's the most specific swimming exercise? It's, mm -hmm. it might arguably be pull-ups, um, mm -hmm. pulling or swimming, such a pull dominant upper body overhead type of, uh, activity. The pull-up is, um, is very specific to that. And. We have a lot of awesome research showing improvements in pull-ups to improvements in swimming. So that would be the vertical pulling pattern. Maybe not everyone can do pull-ups, but that could be a really great place for people to start. I would say the basics, um, get strong in the basics, the fundamentals, the big lifts, and you know, then you can narrow it down and get a little more specific. Um, I couldn't agree more. I'm a huge fan of the pull-up, actually. I actually just put a reel up today on Instagram of my daughter about uh, five years ago doing her first pull-up, and uh, it's kind of funny. So check out my reels on Instagram. My, I think I think at the time she was probably like, uh, what is she? Now? She's probably like nine years old at the time doing some pull-up. But yeah, couldn't agree more with the pull-up itself. Um, crazy good exercise. Um, yeah, exercises for swimmers. There's just there's so many ways we can go here. Interesting that you said, you know, swimming is the most specific thing you can do. Like, why why is specificity so important? Well, it's, uh, you know, in strength and conditioning, we use this term um, specific adaptation to impose demands. But if you want to get better at something, you have to do that thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, again, it, it really depends on your goals. How much time can you be swimming? How much have you been swimming? Um, you know, you could correct me maybe, but the, the best swimmers in the world are probably swimming 20 plus hours per week. Um where on the continuum do you want to be with that? I'm at a place in my life where I like to swim, I don't know, four to five hours per week. And I like to supplement it with strength training. It depends on what I'm training for, but do the thing that you want to get good at. Um, and there's, there's things that supplementally can help that. But ultimately, if you want to get good at something, you have to do that thing. Right. Well, in terms of best exercise for swimmers, as you said, your Instagram has so many examples of, of things that you could possibly do. And, um, and then if people sign up for your newsletter, you can, you can get information that way as well. Let's move on to core strength because I think this is such a huge topic in swimming and 
really it's only been in the last kind of 20 years that i've noticed core being a focus it was certainly kind of catch oriented um in the 90s where it was like you know you gotta you gotta get your high elbow it was all high elbow type stuff and then you know then when then we went into kick driven strokes but now we're really connecting the the upper body and the lower body with the core and the core is such a huge focal point so talk to me about core strength i mean we could argue it all stems from the core and, and you just work center out and if you don't have position in your core your hips and shoulders don't move efficiently from a biomechanics standpoint if we look at your streamline and, and how you're shaped as a vessel moving through the water, if your core is distorted, your arms and legs are going to be off, uh, the way you use them is going to be off, your ability to produce force. And not to mention some of like the lower back discomfort that we see, um, you know, maybe swimmers being hyperextended and in this uphill position. So if you can really center your core, get your ribs stacked over your pelvis, get that aligned. If you imagine there's like two blocks, your hips and shoulders are going to be more mobile they're gonna be stronger, you're gonna be more streamlined, you're more efficient moving through the water. I kind of have a love hate with core training because I think a lot of people look at it as like sit-ups and crunches and like mm -hmm. a lot of this anterior chain, crunching, mm -hmm. flexing the spine, which can be fine, but it's really looking at it three-dimensionally, a 360 view. And we're looking for uh, we're looking for the centered and stacked position. And you really just want this tall top body line and kind of this, this pillar strength. I was actually going to say that, you know, what is the core? What, what does it comprise of primarily, you think? Yeah, I mean, we could say chest to chest to hips, chest to knees. Um, it's it's the, your center of mass, um, but your abdominals, your obliques, your lower back. Um, again, this 360 degree view. So if you're not tackling your core training from front, side and back, you, you could be imbalanced in that way. And, um, you know, going back to the swimmers, when we have a lot of maybe this posterior chain extension, um, they're going to be more in an uphill position. They're going to be creating drag. They might have discomfort in their back um, and their ability to produce force in their hips and shoulders might be off. Yeah, it's interesting that you kind of incorporate the obliques on the side here and also the lower back because it's not, you know, most people used to just think about kind of a six pack of like, oh, I've just got to get these six muscles here kind of bigger and stronger and that's my core. It's way beyond that, right? Yeah, it's all about being centered. It's about muscular balance. So Going back to taking a look at function, even some of these like high caliber Olympic level swimmers, we could take a look at that and maybe overdeveloped in one area, it's leading to compensations, injuries. So we can be smart and holistic about kind of rebalancing things. Um, they're going to be a more efficient and performance definitely improves. And Dan, I used to do a lot of uh, core and stability work and I used to get really, really tight in these kind of, these, these muscles here that the physios used to kind of stick their thumbs in all the time and kind of lose. And it was like, oh my God, it was like the most painful thing that anyone could ever do to me. But yeah. because I was working my core so much, they, they would really tighten up here. What, what are those muscles? Probably a psoas, yeah, which psoas. gets a lot of attention. If you've ever had that dug out, it's a uh, religious yep. experience. Um, psoas, yeah. But yeah, that anterior chain, arguably getting overused and is, is tight, but it's compensating for something else. So like if something is uh, too tight on the front, it means something slack on the back. So we really, we're just looking for balance. Okay. And if you find you're always like digging something out, getting it rubbed out, foam rolling, stretching, it just, if something's always tight or always weak, you know, other end of the spectrum, um, we, we want to take a look at balance and make sure that things are even. Uh, Cause when the body's in balance, it doesn't have these tightnesses and these weaknesses and mm. uh, yeah. I was actually going to bring this up a little bit later. I, I'd listed it later, but lower back injury, lower back care kind of thing. I would always get these these lower back um, pinches and strains. And, and specifically, it usually happened around taper time when I started to rest a little bit more. And I, I could never figure out why all of a sudden I was getting a lower back strain during taper. And then all of a sudden I'd have to kind of rest and do nothing for a week when I really wanted to kind of fine tune some things a bit. Is, does that make sense to you why that would happen then? I don't know. I mean, I could theorize it. We want to look at the athlete individually and be specific about it. But um, I don't know, maybe maybe intensity and, and tempo and, and velocity are increasing during that time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were. I can remember being kind of warned or, or reminded that as volume's coming down, we decrease caloric intake and just kind of watch your weight, make sure you're not mm -hmm. putting on a couple extra pounds. But for those of us who you know might have a couple extra pounds to lose, like particularly in the stomach, if you're putting on some weight in the front of your stomach and your stomach hangs a little heavier as a result, that's going to put you into uh, like what we call an anterior tilt. It's going to kind of pull your pelvis forward, mm -hmm. stomach comes forward, and that puts the back into extension. 
Um, yeah, I would always find that like my biceps would just get bigger during yeah. paper. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a sprinter thing. <laughs> I had to add that in. Sorry. Uh, but you know the back thing. I don't know. Yeah. It's probably about. It's probably something that we you should have been taking a look at like earlier in the season right. and offsetting that. And if it was recurring, uh, definitely something to dig a little deeper and investigate. Well, yeah, I also found too. I wasn't focusing much on the lower back. Like you know, as a freestyle, I'm thinking kind of front. I'm thinking core connection at the front, but it just didn't put a lot of emphasis on core connection at the back. And I felt like I was super strong at times, too strong at the front. And again, those those psoas kind of pulling, they were always so tight there, but my, my core was always really jacked up. My my, my um, obliques from, from a catch, I was very powerful up front, but the back itself in the lower back seemed to be a little bit weaker. So would that play a part? Yeah, I mean, without getting too geeky about anatomy, if we look at the psoas, it attaches to the front of your femur on the front side of your leg, and it runs through your stomach into your lower back. So when that muscle gets tight, it's really pulling on the back mm. and pulling you into extension. And maybe it was just something about the increased intensity and the tempo with your legs and your arms. And I don't know, I, looking at an athlete like you, I, I just imagine this huge engine sometimes, and maybe the chassis or the car is not as uh, solid and robust. Mm -hmm. but it's almost like the engine wants to just like explode out of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. We individualize training in the pool, so why not individualize your nutrition? Erica Barney of Barney Wellness Building will help you and your swimmers get exactly what each athlete needs through genetic testing and personalized nutrition plans. So stop guessing what you should and shouldn't be putting into your body. Athletes within a few weeks have noticed they're recovering faster because they're fueling their body with what they need and staying away from what their body hates. Erica understands swimming. She gets it. She's worked with over 20 Olympians, including the fastest man in the world, Caleb Dressel. Group discounts are available, so go to Biney Wellness Building and get in touch with Erica today. That's Biney, B-E-I-N-E, wellnessbuilding.net. Well, talk to me about lower back care then, because it's such a crucial component here. What, what do we mean um, when we're talking about lower back care? Yeah, I mean, we talked about core a moment ago, but it's it's uh, looking at the core 360 degrees as one holistic unit, front to back, side to side. And I do a thorough assessment with my athletes and take a look at their stability and various positions, front, side, back. And we're looking for muscular balance. We're looking for control, position, being able to align and stay stacked. And then a big thing too, is not just looking at these assessments from a resting position, but what's happening when you become fatigued and how do you compensate and where do things break down? Maybe for you, that was just a weak link and needed a little bit more focus, but um, it's really just about balance. And if someone if someone has discomfort, it's not always uh, that the site of that discomfort and that pain is, is often not the source of the problem. So we kind of want to peel back the layers and th see how things are interconnected and how we could maybe balance that out and uh you know reduce it there was a time where core was not um talked about during dry land exercises and then it became a, a situation where it was almost like connect the core all the time so we went from like never to always um is is that good to be always thinking about the core on every single dry land exercise you do or is there a time to kind of turn it off and relax it well, one thing I would caution people from doing is uh, like, we don't want to be squeezing stuff and like, and tensing up. If you think of something mm. that you do really athletically, you know, swinging a baseball bat, tennis racket, running, you're not squeezing your glutes when you run, you're not squeezing your stomach when you rotate and throw mm. or strike something. So we don't want to be over cueing and overthinking it from that standpoint, but you do want to have an appreciation for how energy transfers from your shoulder through your core to your opposite hip, particularly something like freestyle stroke. Mm -hmm it's it's a conduit for transferring energy and if we can learn to channel energy through that we can produce a tremendous amount of power you know the, the trends in training are kind of like cyclical so uh i don't know maybe it was all about core and then as everyone's like you don't have to train core just do the big lifts and load yourself enough and your core is going to fire and that's true if it's like doing what it's supposed to be doing but we also want to assess and make sure that everything's working the way it should and when it's not we there's some things we can do to kind of rebalance things turn things on get people to to kind of think and and channel where those muscles work again mm -hmm. some of, but ultimately like real function real performance is subconscious because like you're, you can't be thinking about your core when you're doing you know when you're sprinting 50 mm -hmm. freestyle right. you just you're thinking about other things maybe one thing you have a strategy you're set and you focus on it you're not squeezing muscles and and thinking about your psoas and and other uh 
um, I don't know, very esoteric, my small things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. I like that. Um, and again, a lot more information there in terms of core development, core strength, uh, on, on your Instagram, a lot of good stuff there. So, um, I did just sign up for your newsletter and one of the things that it sent me was the six phases of freestyle. Can we just kind of go over those six phases real quick and, and talk about the importance of each, if that's all right? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I do a lot of strength and conditioning and I'm trying to connect the dots between like what we see in the water and then what's going on on land. Cause sometimes if something's off in the water, we could, we could give cues, we could do drills, but you know, maybe there's a limitation on land that's limiting them and it, it might be more successful. It might be faster to hop out of the pool, intervene, do some stuff with the strength work and then get back in. But, uh, so I, I coach technique in the water as well. I do a lot of video analysis and I break the freestyle stroke in particular, working with triathletes, open water swimmers to the six phases, kind of looking at the stroke from fingertips all the way down to toes. But as we go through the six phases of freestyle, and there's probably a couple of different ways to think about it, but you know, you've got your entry and extension phase, entering mm -hmm. the water, reaching, gliding, mm -hmm. you've got your catch and pull phases, and then you have the exit recovery phases. Mm -hmm. So we just break it down, fingertips to toes, giving people singular focuses. What are you doing in the water? What are some drills that will apply to that? What are some strength and conditioning drills that could also help? Are there any mobility or stability restrictions that we could intervene with maybe better on land and then get you back in the water? So it just helps break a very complex stroke into simple parts and give people single focuses to kind of uh, work their way down and kind of like a ripple effect through the body. Yeah, I like that. Uh, I mean, you work with a lot of triathletes and in, in endurance type swimmers and um, but even, even more novice swimmers too, I see this a lot, uh, in, in their techniques, two common problems. Um, they swim very flat. Um, so what can we do to kind of rectify the flatness or, um, the, the big one is the crossover, you know, where they're, where they're crossing over. Um, let's talk about swimming flat first. What could be some, um, you know, ways to kind of, uh, combat that flat in terms of not rotating. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so you're leaving a lot of distance per stroke on the table. If you're not rotating and reaching, I mean, your reach is so much greater if you can rotate and get mm -hmm. long. So right. we want to look at that first. And like, from my perspective, it's like, are you rotating through your upper spine and do you have the mobility in your shoulders mm -hmm. and your hips? And yeah. can you do that on land? And then maybe we can get back in the water and apply that. But, um, very efficient, particularly for endurance swimmers, distance swimmers to be rotating and using more of a hip dominant rotational type of stroke. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a longer stroke. Going back to the core, we harness power through rotation. So if you can reach and get long and really transfer that energy through rotation, mm -hmm. you're going to be able to, to be more efficient and produce more power when you want to. Right. So that's super important. Yeah. I like that. And then what about, um, people that cross over? How do, how do we call, what's the, what's the, um, cause of that and how do we, um, combat that? Uh, well, it could be a lot of things, but fingertips to toes, like if we're entering the water here, it doesn't matter how strong you are, how fit you are. If you're creating this drag immediately, you, the shape and your vessel and the form drag that you're creating going through the water is inefficient. So we want to start by getting you into this position. So we, we could approach it a couple different ways. Coaches just coaching on the pool deck. Let's get them into some of those positions. So like side kicking drills, um, single arm stroke drills, catch up drills, where we really think about having the hand in front of the shoulder rotating to the other side, you know, kind of staying on these rails or these tracks and being efficiency efficient with the symmetry. Mm -hmm. And then if it's a mobility restriction, mm -hmm. can you, can you rotate? Are your shoulders moving the way they're supposed to? Can you mm -hmm. rotate through your upper spine to get into this position? Or do you have some type of mobility compensation that's forcing you to get into this position? I work with a lot of, um, adult swimmers where maybe we're, we're lacking mobility. They, they can't mm. get their arms up into position. Mm. They, they're not rotating as well. We see some changes in their posture mm -hmm. and those things are limiting. So they're, they're using a strategy that's best for them based on those limitations. So there might right. be some things that we can do with strength training to help improve their efficiency. Right. And, and I guess flexibility would come into it too, right? Yeah. Mobility, flexibility for sure. So let's make sure like we've got full range of motion at the shoulder, full range of motion through rotation, and then see if they can get back in the water and kind of tap into that. Um, and then of course, you know, there's, there's technique and drills to do as well. How do you feel about static stretching? Uh, I think it has its place. I think it's overused. Uh, if we, again, if you look at muscular balance, um, like when one muscle shortening, another muscle is getting long. We talked about the core, like anterior core getting short, lower back getting long. Do you have an appreciation for that? Maybe more of a dynamic stretching approach where you're 
maybe strengthening the lower back while you stretch the anterior core can be a really like synergistic way to kind of pair things together. Um, it, so for a variety of reasons, static stretching might have its place, but, uh, you know, there's a protocol like PNF stretching, contract, relax, where we contract one muscle um, to get length and another, maybe, you know, squeezing the bicep to get long mm. in the tricep. Mm. Um, although that's probably an area that no one's ever really tight, but um, stretching has its place. I'm a big fan of, of soft tissue work as well, like foam rolling, massage, mm. other interventions like acupuncture, rolfing, grass, and these things to intervene and manipulate tissue. But ultimately, because static stretching is kind of like in a vacuum, it's passive. If you're not applying and reinforcing that in an active way with your activity and kind of teaching your brain how to use those ranges of motion, you're kind of always going to fall back to that those tight muscles, that tight psoas, um, and some of these um, these defaults that you go to because there's some type of imbalance. Right. Now, with the six phases of freestyle here, especially in terms of kind of the upper body work, you and I both have um a belief and an association in, in vasa training you know I, I love it i think it's awesome um i know you use it how do you utilize it why do you think it's good what do you get out of it yeah uh so lots of ways if, oh, a big one is efficiency so looking at like triathletes adult swimmers working professionals who want to be more efficient with their training maybe they can't always get to the pool for the amount of time that they want to maybe they have to travel really far to get to their pool during the pandemic, pools were closed. Like in New York City, it's really hard to get pool time. I was mm. on my VASA every night uh, for months. Mm. And, it, you know, it was a godsend. It was a blessing. So from an efficiency standpoint, we can we can get some really good focused uh, work on power. Um, it can be very specific to, to technique. So sometimes it, it's so chaotic in the water, like everything you're thinking about, your breath, your position, the six phases of freestyle, squeezing things, stretching things. If we can get somebody out and and really just pattern like a high elbow catch on the Vasa and get some feedback from the paddle and see some feedback on the power meter and, and, the, and the noise from the fan. These things can be really powerful teaching tools, low volume, kind of pattern it, get back in the water, apply it to your stroke. Uh, so I really like it as a teaching tool with technique and efficiency. And I, I like it from an efficiency standpoint, um, being able to develop some like short end power, some low dose, high intensity work. And then get in the pool and you know do some of the longer stuff or you know whatever your focus is for your distance what about workouts on on the vasa trainer how, how do you come up with workouts or where do you find them like I, I i don't know where to start for people that just um want to get a vasa and get on it and get going on it you know how do they find the resources for that uh well they got a lot of great educational content their um their products come with with some programs they got a great 12-week power plan they teach you how to test your power how to integrate power you know, power is something we can't really measure in the water unless you mm -hmm. have sophisticated tools and there's some emerging things coming out. But when you get on the VASA, you can look at left to right stroke differential. You can look at power development left to right. And mm -hmm. maybe you're pulling a lot less on your non-dominant arm, like your left arm, for example. Um, how do you program? Get a coach. Uh, I love writing programs for those products. They offer some programming and education. Mm -hmm. There's so much content on the internet, on YouTube, on Instagram, aligned with people who are promoting this type of training. And then the way I look at it is just energy system development. So we talked earlier about how I don't just work with swimmers. I work with endurance athletes, marathoners, triathletes. And if you have an understanding of energy system development and, and how to train uh, specific distances, specific intensities, it's really mm -hmm. just the same principles, whether you're a runner or you're on the VASA or you're in the pool in terms of developing your cardiovascular system and how you use fuel for energy and how you can develop that. It's, um, it's a lot of the same stuff. A lot of the great sets that many of the listeners know from the swim world could apply if you want to run a marathon after your swimming, you know, career or do a triathlon or, or get mm. on the boss and just train at home. Mm, yeah. You're delusional. I don't want to run a marathon at all. Um, <laughs> I'm, I was born a sprinter. I, I'm going to die a sprinter. I think, uh, look, I, I love, I love triathlon. I love to watch it. Um, and they just had the world championship in St. George and, uh, you know, I was watching that over the weekend, um, you know, 70, what is it? 70, 70 K something They're like, yeah. Ridiculous. Like, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know how far that is. It's just so far. Like I, I go for 20 seconds, you know, that's it. And, um, but man, all power to them. Like, it's just impressive to see that the, the work and the, the mental fortitude that these athletes have and, and put themselves through that and compete at that high level and and they're swimming at uh, such a pace and they're running at a pace and they're cycling at a pace it's like these guys then they're not floating you know what i mean like they're going at a clip 
So there must be so much work that goes into this type of stuff. And I guess that's where the Vasa trainer can come in and, and, and substitute a lot of that, you know, work that they, they need to do as well. So that's, uh, that's really cool stuff, man. Good, good information there. Uh, I also, I was looking at your Instagram and you're talking about a couple of interesting things to me and I, I didn't know what you meant by them. So talk to me about the definitions here of what is stable endurance training? Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Torn sometimes between using uh, like esoteric strength and conditioning principle terms and, and just lay terms, but uh, stability training is just core strength. It's stable endurance training is being stable. So we talked a lot about body line already. We talked about core strength and that's just a thought process that I use to take a look at those core positions and how you balance yourself on your front, on your side and on your back. And are you stable in those positions? Can you hold them for the length of time that you need to, to do a particular event? Um, yeah, it's, it's just stability. It's being able to, um, control movement. So if you were holding a plank and I came over and, and pushed or gave you some, um, you know, intervene a little bit and knock you around, can you hold and, and maintain stability in that position? And to the same extent, when you're in the water, the water's pushing you around, there's chop, uh, there's various things, even going through like a flip turn and being able to hold position while you go through that, being able to hold position as you accelerate and increase your pace. Are there, are there drills that you can do in the water for stable endurance training? Absolutely. Yeah. So it's a lot of, it's the same core planking positions that, you know, many of our athletes are doing out there already. So, uh, you know, kicking on your stomach on the surface, kicking on your side, kicking on your back, transitioning through those positions and mm -hmm. doing things in kind of a slow controlled way at first, and then picking up speed and tempo, adding fins, you know, the pinnacle of this is being able to hold a solid plank during your taper prior to a big meet and not having lower back pain, you know, right before something big. Yeah. That's interesting. You say that uh, swimming slow, it's such an undervalued skill of swimming slow. And it's actually the first thing that I would teach any of my freshmen that were coming into college is like, slow down. Like we need to do this. Well, we need to do it controlled. We need to do, do it stable, you know, and a lot of them were just moving fast and out of control and no connection. And so the, the first kind of two months for me was slowing them down and, and figuring out connection. It's such a huge component, right? Yeah. I mean, how can you learn something fast right out of the gate? We, we're going to slow things down. We're going to break it into component parts. You're going to do one piece of it at a time. You're going to pattern it. You know, can you get in your high elbow over and over and over again with various drills, maybe mm -hmm. mobility drills. Mm -hmm. And then the pinnacle of that is doing a 50 freestyle and being able to do that without thinking about it and have it just happen for, I don't know, whatever, 20 strokes. Yeah. Uh, and then talk to me about mobile endurance training. What does that mean? So we actually want to start with mobility. So all your joints and muscles moving the way that they should. So mobile endurance training is just a term that I use for taking a look at the mobility. That's important for all human beings, but particularly for endurance athletes. And there's and, that ambulance uh, you were talking about. Yeah. New York city. I'm right here on Broadway. Um, <laughs> but yeah, mobility is just making sure that everything's moving through the full range of motion. There's an anatomical standard for how our joint should move. It's a range, but everyone should fall within that range. And if there's any deficits, that's where we start. We want to restore those deficits and then we want to load them or or train them fast or you know train them far depending on your goal what do you mean by deficits exactly yeah a classic one for swimming is maybe we take a look at shoulder flexion so like you should mm. be able to get your arm into like 170 degrees of flexion you know with mm. your bicep all the way almost all the way up to your ear and we see people kind of come in and maybe they look like this or they look mm. like this and their streamlines are here mm. so maybe we need to foam roll and stretch their lats foam roll and stretch their pecs um mm give them some strength on their posterior chain to pull into this position. Um, so when they, when they can't get into ranges of motion that their body should, because they're a human being, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what the sport is. Um, anyone lacking shoulder flexion is going to be limited doing the things they want to do, whether it's f swimming freestyle, throwing a baseball. I don't know. I have personal training clients who need to put luggage in an overhead compartment on an airplane. And these are things that we're working on because the human body should do those things. <laughs> Destro Swim Towers. Gain strength in the water with a tower of power. Save $150 per double swim tower by using code BRETT, B-R-E-T-T, -T, at checkout. DestroMachines.com. Vasa has been the go-to training tool outside of the pool for over 30 years. Vasa's products are ideal for developing power and proper technique in your swimmer's catch. Add a few Vasa trainers to your pool deck and it's like adding an extra lane to your swimming pool. 
Go to vasatrainer.com, use code BREAD at checkout and get 10% off anything from Vasa. Right. Yeah. And this kind of leads me into the next point of um, exercises for recovery. I think this is such a, a, a area of swimming and training and philosophy that has really taken off in, in the last 10 years, especially so, somewhat in the last 20 years, but the last 10 years, it's become a major focus of training component, you know? So it's like now, now it is, it used to just be like survival of the fittest, you know, how long can you go for as, as hard as you can go. And then when you break down, we'll, we'll take uh, the afternoon off or, you know, whatever it is. And now it's like recovery's built in, not only just swim recovery, but also recovery outside of the pool. So uh, <clears throat> to, talk to me about both. Let's start with, with swim recovery. What does that mean to you? Well, you know, there's a saying that your training is only good, as good as your recovery. So you, you're not getting fitter and stronger and faster when you're training. You're actually breaking yourself down. You're breaking mm -hmm. yourself into a deficit. So all the recovery or really all the adaptation is happening during the recovery phases outside of your sessions. Mm -hmm. Recovery and swimming, I, I think it's the same. We want to look at how much stress can someone handle? Are we building that up in a progressive way, having periods where we take breaks, mental and physical? But, um, you know, there's going to be these periods of what we call overreaching, where you're digging yourself into a hole, you're pushing, it's, it's breaking you down, it's mentally exhausting. What are some of the, the credits you can put back in the bank to kind of restore yourself, rejuvenate yourself when you have a late training session, you got to get up to the morning and do it again, or be in the weight room um, and hitting at a high intensity. Really, the best athletes are the ones who are recovering the fastest, so they can get back into the pool, get back into the gym and train really hard. And in my opinion, it's it's a game of like small, like 1%, like all these little things that you can be doing. The, the starting point is like the big rocks. Are you getting enough sleep? What's your hydration like? How's your nutrition? Um, then we can look at some things with exercise. So look, you talked going slow. Going slow also has really great application for mm -hmm. being restorative. Uh, slow, steady state aerobic cardio where you can breathe and relax is great for your circulation, great for flushing out waste, bringing in good things. It can be anti-inflammatory. It can lower resting heart rate. It can bring the sense of like well-being and calm. So having some sessions where you're going easy, it's not all about training hard and fast all the time right. from both the technique and a recovery standpoint. Um, and then just kind of go on about it. We can get into foam rolling, stretching, getting massage, acupuncture, meditation, mm. Supplementation, which is probably only one percent, but uh, you know, within the confines of of uh, what works for you, um, you know, these can be some things we can consider to the extent that you have access to it. Do you deal with any of that, Dan? Do you deal with supplementation at all with your programs? Uh, I do to some extent. You know, it's it's a gray area, so we want to be careful mm -hmm. to make sure that you're taking supplements that are legal for your um, mm -hmm. for your organization. Mm -hmm. We might want to consult with a medical professional. I'm a nutritionally certified coach, but I'm not a nutritionist. So I'm going to be careful about things that I recommend that people are ingesting and taking. And um, I think a really great coach knows when to refer out and lean on other professionals and have a team of professionals. They can look at this, make sure you're getting quality products, making sure the science is there. Supplementation is, is like 1% benefit. So if you're not already maxing out some of these other big rocks, like if you're not sleeping enough, you don't need to be taking other things. If you're if you're consuming too much caffeine, for example, maybe you just need to get more sleep. So these things can be helpful, but we want to take a look at it holistically, get some other people on our team and in our corner to help uh, people, you know, who, who, professionals who have some expertise in the area. Uh, oh, this is awesome stuff, man. I love it, by the way. Um, I, I want to save some of your, your stuff, actually, because it's so good and so valuable. I want to save it for the, the stuff that you put out. Um, so I want people to come and find you, uh, especially on your Instagram. That's one way. Um, but you're also now part of Any Question, which is an exciting new platform where people can um, subscribe, ask you questions, answer them just directly like this. Um, you've just jumped on the platform. How are you finding it so far? I love it. I want to be a resource. I want people to ask questions. So I don't want to just be like putting out content all the time. I love to coach. I love to educate. I love to teach. So I encourage people to ask questions, come to me, ask, challenge things like not everything I'm saying is 100% right, or I might learn something tomorrow that's going to change my thought process today. So I want to engage in a dialogue. I want to have a discussion. Um, I'm really happy to answer people's questions and, and provide the resources that maybe some people don't have access to and mm. just help elevate the sport and you know bring some good information to swimming and strength training.
Yeah, listen, there's so many interesting, incredible experts on this platform. It's five bucks a month. It's not it's not going to break the budget. It's probably like a Starbucks coffee that you go out and get. Um, so, you know, once a month. So five bucks a month, 50 bucks a year is, is um, very, very reasonable for the people that we have access to, including myself and you now. But you, as you were talking about recovery, I was st starting to think to myself, like all these questions I have about recovery, and I'm going to get on the platform after this. I'm going to fire some recovery questions at you. So... Uh, people can certainly follow up with some of your answers on there uh, as well, which is exciting. So um, definitely check out any question for that. Um, uh, one other thing I wanted to, to talk about, obviously, is uh, injuries, um, shoulder specific. I mean, such a common area for swimming, probably, you know, obviously the most common area for swimming in terms of uh, injuries. So, um, you know, talk to me about shoulder injuries and maybe shoulder prevention, uh, injury, injury prevention. Shoulder care is huge. Shoulder injury is probably the number one. It's probably the number one area injured by swimmers. So mm -hmm. there's this like catch-all term, swimmer shoulder, but it's it's very complex. It's the most mobile joint in your body. It's a joint that's only held in place by soft tissue. So it's complex, front and back, side to side. We've got external superficial muscles. We've got deep muscles. Uh, you know, I could geek out on this because I'm actually very interested in this from, you know, anatomically, you've got the shoulder blade, you've got your collarbone, you have the shoulder joint, you have your thoracic spine, all these things are interconnected. So when we see an issue, a, a shoulder, a swimmer shoulder, a shoulder impingement, it's like, well, what specifically is impinged? You know, there's a highway of tissue that goes through some of these joints and any number one of them can get pinched, irritated, aggravated, things that are moving too much, things that aren't moving enough. Um, so first and foremost, because it's a mobile joint, we want to make sure that it's mobile enough. So are all those parts moving as much as they should, but not more than they should. So kind of going back to stretching, you can overstretch. We don't want to, if something doesn't need to be stretched, let's not stretch it. But if it needs to, talking about deficits again, let's restore those deficits. But then there's also portions of that joint that should be stable. And, and through different phases of your stroke, the mobility and stability changes. Uh, there's like an ebb and a flow to when you produce force and when you relax. And that's really important to being athletic. So we want to look at all that. A really good uh, coach or professional is going to kind of, I don't want to use the word posture, but take a look at it, like assess your shoulder, see how your shoulder blades are sitting, how your shoulders sit, how you move through different ranges of motion, how you move when you do your sport, how you swim in the water and do a very holistic and thorough assessment process to take a look at how that's moving and then program specific exercises for you to help maintain the good mobility you have, restore the mobility you don't have, be more stable where you need to be stable. And if you're in pain, you know, go see a, a pain professional, go see a, a medical professional that understands movement and appreciates your sport and can help you uh, kind of you peel back those layers and get to the source of it. Good stuff, man. I love that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm so impressed. You, you're I've only just caught on to you recently, but um, I'm already a huge fan. So um, you obviously know your stuff, man. And um, I would like to be coached by you. Uh, maybe if I do pick up uh, triathlons in the future, I might I might get on a program. Uh, so I'm going to get you to do a 10K. <laughs> 10K sounds like a long way. That's not that long, is it? Is, is that the it's short program? Cool. Sorry? Is that the short program? Yeah, that's the short program. Okay. That's I think the beginner I program. How, how far do I have to run? Well, it's up to you. <laughs> if you're doing triathlon well yeah. you get uh you could start out with a sprint a, a sprint We're not yeah, like, how, how far are the sprints in triathlon uh the swims are like four to eight hundred yards meters depending on where it is and crush how you that. structure it crush that yeah what else yeah um runs i don't know um three to three to six miles and then 15 to 30 mile bike ride that's not bad right I could... bike before a run i should know I think I, I think I could handle the, the yeah I think I could handle that you jump on a bike after the swim kind of get get a little drink break you know as you as you're pedaling and then um and then finish off with the run I don't know I've never tried it sounds difficult but uh I think I'm willing I think I think I'll, I'll give one a crack all right um yeah you and, you and I can get together and maybe start some training for a while and pinpoint pinpoint one of these uh these little circuits we can go to and and maybe do it you know that'd be cool sounds like a deal Dan, I love it, man. Thanks. Uh, a lot of good information there. Uh, and again, there's so much more to offer uh, that, that you've got. Um, uh, good stuff. Appreciate it. Is there anything else you wanted to, to touch on before we run? No, I appreciate it. Great conversation. I'd love to continue it on any question. Uh, follow me along on Instagram. Let's engage. Let's connect. Um, 
yeah, I want to continue to promote the sport. I'm just yeah. getting started. You're just getting started. So it's really great to connect here and just have a chat. Awesome, Dan. Thanks a lot, mate. All right. Take care. I appreciate this. Thanks, Brett. Event, heat, lane, name of swimmer, times and places. It's called Swim Nerd Live, and it allows the data and times from your actual scoreboard to be broadcast and viewed in real time on any smart TV, phone, or other device. There are so many things you can do with this software. A very simple and easy to use necessity for any team or facility that is live streaming their meets results. One click on any device and they're watching your swim meet live in real time. Go to swimpractice.com to learn more.